Hello, everybody. Welcome to the talk. This is my Uncle Tom Hopper. He entered World War II at Normandy a few days after the initial invasion. He was assigned to the 159th Combat Engineering Battalion with responsibilities to repair roads, build bridges, and clear landmines. Tragically, the first casualties in my uncle's company occurred on the first day of clearing mines. Have you seen the old war movies where the soldiers are clearing the minefields? The scene plays out with a combat engineer operating a minesweeper, complete with headphones. He's slowly sweeping left and right as he carefully steps, listening for the telltale screech to signal the location of a mine. When he sees it, he stops, slowly reaches down, and carefully digs up the mine. Would it surprise you to know that the reality was a lot different? You see, metal detectors work for metal mines. But it was very common in the theater to have non-metallic mines. So how do you find a non-metallic mine? You can lie on your stomach and gouge the ground slowly with a bayonet in the hopes that you'll find one but you don't really know where to start looking. The faster way is to walk into a minefield and step on one. Yes, I'm serious. That was my uncle's job. You see, the mines in World War II didn't explode when you stepped on them. They exploded when you stepped off of them. And apparently, my uncle stepped on a lot of mines. Thankfully, he survived stepping on mines through a combination of teamwork, good communication, and effective training. He learned that when walking into a minefield, it makes sense to proceed slowly, carefully listening with every sense, each deliberate step, listening for the firing pin to engage waiting for the sound of the telltale click of the firing pin getting ready to explode. As soon as you stepped on a mine, you would let the other guys in your squad know that you stepped on a mine. Someone would carefully retrace your footsteps to bring you the end of a hundred foot rope. You would tie the rope around your waist securely and be prepared for what you knew was coming. Four or five of the other men in your squad would run as hard and as fast as they could until the slack in the rope was taken up and you were violently yanked off the exploding mine. Really. If they were able to yank you hard enough and fast enough, you wouldn't be hurt. Since my uncle was the smallest guy in the squad, he was the lucky one nominated to go find the mines. It was a lot easier to pull a small guy far away from the exploding mine. Can you imagine how sore you would be from the whiplash you just received? But finding one mine doesn't tell you a whole lot. You see, mines are laid in patterns. So after going through this hell, you've got to go out there into the minefield again. This will tell you the spacing. Looking around, it doesn't appear that any of us have been in the actual minefield. Yet, each day we wade into a proverbial minefield every day in our jobs. Instead of being in a distant battlefield, we walk past fields of hidden risk every day, 
in our companies, and in our industry. Just as it takes communication and teamwork to detect, avoid, and clear the landmines on a battlefield, it takes communication and teamwork to avoid being injured in our own minefields. I don't mean the physical danger that's inflicted by an exploding mine, but the career and credibility damage that may occur. If there is an incident, your company could have its reputation wounded. During our time together today, I'm going to share my experiences avoiding landmines in our own backyards. It turns out the process isn't that much different than what my uncle used in World War II. The first step, imagine that you're going for a meeting in another company to discuss security services. As you open the door, you're greeted with a pleasant appearance of carefully coordinated paint, carpet, and furniture. Sitting behind a polished cherry desk is a young, pretty, well-dressed woman typing at her computer. Just as she sees you, the telephone rings. She smiles and asks if she can hold on a minute so she can answer the phone. You hear her answer the phone with the same greeting you'll hear many times while you're waiting in the lobby. After answering a few questions, she consults in the phone extension list on her desk and says, please let me transfer your call to them. If I lose you, you can call them directly at. When she hangs up the phone, she turns her attention back to you and asks, may I help you? Yes, I'm here to meet with Bob. Is he expecting you? Yes. Okay, I'll let him know that you're here. She points to a three-ring binder on the desk and asks, Would you mind signing the visitor log and having a seat? As you begin to sign the log, you notice some interesting people have visited the company recently. You notice that her desk is covered with spreadsheets and other documents. As you sign the log, she says, I'm, I'm sorry, he's not answering the phone. If you'll hold on, I'll go get him. And she leaves the room. While you're looking around, you notice the logo behind the desk. You notice the potted plant that's covering the unsightly network cables and power cables. Start looking around. There's these presentations over here that's been completed. She's got a spreadsheet up on her monitor where she hasn't logged off. This spreadsheet that's on her monitor, you've never seen a spreadsheet with so many tabs, and you've certainly never seen one that goes all the way to column JX. Soon the receptionist returns, and she says, he'll be here in a couple of minutes. While you're sitting there admiring the artwork, and the adjoining conference room, someone comes to the front desk and says, here's my temporary door card back. I found the other one underneath my car seat. She takes the temporary door card and places it in the desk. So how many potential landmines did you spot? Well, the receptionist did not know to expect a visitor. She leaves the front desk unattended with a visitor in the lobby. Someone with a camera phone could easily take pictures of the visitor's log, the documents on the desk, or her monitor screen. There are completed presentations on her desk. How serious is that? Well, the Ponymon study rated the cost of a data breach at $214 per record. But that can seriously underestimate the impact. Can you imagine the impact on the share price if the news of a merger or takeover were in that presentation? What if it were the design plans for a new product? The computer is logged on and unlocked. Malware could be put on the machine without having to go through a firewall or IPS system. The network cabling is hidden from view and could easily conceal a rogue access point. 
If you ask the receptionist some gently probing questions, you may find that she stepped on these landmines for some very good reasons. She didn't want to leave you waiting in the lobby. Since the company's trying to do more work with fewer people, she's helping the marketing people put together their presentation material. There's so much idle time between visitors that she helps the senior management with a lot of clerical work. Management has spent a lot of time and money making the lobby an attractive area, but they really don't like the eyesore of cable. And since she doesn't want to leave her desk to get door cards, she keeps the door cards in her desk. So how can we avoid the injury from these landmines? Instead of leaving the desk to go get Bob, she could call for him over the intercom. If she needs to help the marketing people, then she could probably work on a rolling cart that could be rolled safely to a secure area when the lobby is unattended. We can classify the sensitivity level of the data and the security level of the various work areas so employees will understand the risk. The network switch port could be secured with network switch security so that if somebody attempted to put a rogue access point, it would disable the port. Returning to our story, Bob arrives at the front desk. After the initial greeting, he leads you to his office. On the way, you pass a large area with half-height cubicles. Bob notices your glance and explains, that's our 24-7 customer service department. They're really doing a great job. Their average speed to answer benchmark has been on the mark for the last six months, and our customer satisfaction surveys are outstanding. As you scan the cube prairie, you notice sprouts of people scattered throughout. They're mostly young people wearing headsets. Some of the headsets are wireless models. One of the nearby reps is being especially chatty. How many potential landmines did you spot? Well, the 24-hour customer service department may not be receiving good communication between the shifts. They may not be receiving good security awareness training. This could make them vulnerable to social engineering attacks. If the reps are too chatty, they can provide useful information to a social engineer. The company has purchased wireless headsets. If protected data is discussed over these and they're not encrypted, you can leak data. If they continue to broadcast while the call is disconnected, it can allow an attacker a microphone into your company. If you ask the customer service reps some questions probing at the issues, you can see that they are focused on customer service. Their yearly performance reviews focus on customer satisfaction issues. They're instructed to never hang up on a caller, but are also evaluated on their total talk time. So how can we avoid these landmines? Make sure that security issues are communicated to everyone regardless of the shift. Train everyone, and especially the customer service people, how to recognize and to respond to social engineering attacks. Encourage the reps to be polite, but not overly chatty. If wireless headsets are used, Make sure they're encrypted. We continue walking to Bob's office. As we settle into a modest wooden frame visitor's chair across from his strong manager's desk, you notice every third fluorescent tube has been disconnected to save electricity. Bob looks at you and says, I'll have Bruce, our systems administrator, bring us a network diagram. He used to work in customer service until we decided we needed a network administrator. Bruce brings a network diagram to you. It's pretty much, he says everything is pretty much there except for a few department 
things that have been added by the operations department. If you glance at the diagram, and some of the text is hard to read because of the printing on the other side. You look at the other side and see that they have recycled their printer paper. As you're looking at the diagram, you notice the familiar names of DC, FS, SQL, and mail. How many potential landmines did you spot? Reducing lighting can create physical security problems if the lights are exterior rooms and the lights are turned off at night. If the desire to save electricity extends to the computers, infrequently used computers may be overlooked when patching systems. The company has an inexperienced systems administrator. Now don't get me wrong, I have nothing against inexperienced systems administrators. I used to be one. But an inexperienced systems administrator may not understand the need for a vulnerability assessment and patch management. If they do, they may not understand how to do it effectively. For example, they may apply operating system patches but overlook the third party applications. When I was just getting started as a systems administrator, I thought disaster recovery was having a tape backup. Later, someone told me that I should take a backup tape home at night so I would have an off-site backup. According to a Symantec study taken earlier this year, medium-sized businesses, that's businesses with between 100 and 1,000 employees, do not have a disaster recovery plan in 47% of the cases. More shocking is that small businesses with below 100 employees do not have a disaster recovery plan in 57% of the cases. Of the companies that do not have a disaster recovery plan, 52% believe that computers are not critical to their business. This is a landmine waiting to explode. There's an often quoted statistic that says that companies without a disaster recovery plan, if they lose data, will go out of business within two years, at least 80% of the time. This number appears to be an urban legend, but I can tell you that having a disaster recovery plan is an example of due care in the protection of business assets. There are some landmines related to disaster recovery and business continuity. If you've never dealt with a backup site, there are three types of sites. There's cold, there's warm, and there's hot. Cold sites do not have any equipment. Warm sites have limited equipment, and hot sites have enough equipment to be operational within a few hours. If you have a warm or medium site, you need to make sure that your equipment is patched and monitored. Also, if you have a disaster, you don't want to be locked out of the machine, so it's very tempting to have insecure passwords, such as passwords on the, the disaster equipment. Closely related to the disaster recovery plans, and more often overlooked, is not having a computer incident response and incident response capability. In a study published by Panda Security in the second quarter of 2011, they found that 40% of the computers that came to their website for their online scanner was infected with a virus. 68% of those were Trojans. Most of these people already had an existing antivirus program that did not detect the problem. I know in my day job, I frequently encounter malware, and I will send a sample to VirusTotal for the first stage analysis. I'm typically seeing about 50% detection rates on run-of-the-mill malware. The good stuff has a 2% or lower detection rate. How many IT people, when their virus, antivirus program catches a virus, will pat themselves on the back and say, huh, I'm up to date with my antivirus, everything's cool. If your antivirus catches a problem, 
you need to do a full incident response and root cause analysis. This is a really big landmine that can cause major business casualties. In our story, the operations department uses what is known as the shadow IT department. The shadow IT department is when you have outsiders or people that are not overseen by the corporate IT department develop systems. Systems developed by the shadow IT department may be improperly configured, improperly patched, and they may not be part of the disaster recovery plan. If the system goes down, you could be hosed. The code may have been developed by inexperienced developers and subject to design flaws or command injections. The developers may not have a good understanding of security principles. They may not have been properly vetted. You don't know who these people are. They could be just Joe setting up shop. They may be using your confidential data to design and program with, and they may still have a copy of your data. The systems administrator is using a self-documenting network naming convention. If an intruder gains access to this network, he'll easily be able to find the goods without having to make a lot of noise by mapping the network. Reusing paper, I mentioned earlier, can be a big problem, but one of the more serious problems is password reuse. An inexperienced systems administrator may have the same local administrator account for each machine. If you ask a few probing questions from this administrator, you may see that the company is very interested in reducing cost. There may be a shortage of qualified candidates. Or the company may be hiring inexperienced people hoping that they will learn on the job. The company may be experiencing financial pressures that limit who it can hire. They may not have enough knowledge to know the skills that are needed or be able to assess whether the person that they're interviewing has these skills. So how can we avoid these landmines? Well, make sure that the staff understands that certain lights should not be turned off. If they want to turn off lights, suggest that it's interior lights such as bathrooms, but exterior lights and in sensitive areas should remain lit. If paper is reused, they should make sure that paper with sensitive information is not reused. If computers are turned off for extended period, your patch management system should use a wake on LAN technology to make sure that all computers get updated. Ideally, the companies will hire qualified people, but if the senior technical person is inexperienced, you can find inexpensive or no cost training if you look very carefully. If a disaster recovery plan doesn't exist, it needs to be created. To help the business units understand the need for disaster recovery, you should work with them to identify the business impact if a system becomes unavailable, corrupted, or has its information disclosed. Once the impact has been dis determined, a reasonable estimate of probability can be obtained. If there is a disaster recovery plan, the equipment should be maintained and monitored on a regular basis. I realize this sounds like common sense, but at a previous employer, we had a disaster site that was co-located with a sister organization. They had a tendency to repurpose the idle equipment with the intention of replacing it if it was ever needed. Of course, the, the equipment was never replaced. If your company doesn't have an incident response plan, you should start working on one immediately. You may think that nobody wants your data. That's what Sony thought too, and it's costing them $171 million and counting. If they had been prepared for that breach, they could have handled the incident with a lot less reputational damage. The best way to prevent security breaches is to have a good vulnerability assessment, patch management system, security awareness training, least user privileges, and avoid password reuse. If you outsource some of your IT functions, make sure that you properly vet the service providers before you select them. I'm actually behind on my slides, I apologize. 
Getting back to our story, as you're reviewing the network diagram, a tall, slender man peeks in the door. Bob, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I need those numbers for the Western region. Sure, I'll get them to you shortly. I'm almost finished here. Bob quickly introduces you to Stan, the guy from sales and marketing. Stan is always on the road, so we won't have time to slowly probe the issues. Let's just look for the landmines. It's not uncommon for salespeople to change companies on a regular basis, and when they do, they often take their good customers with them. They can get insider access to customer lists, pricing, business strategies, and business processes. At the very least, they'll remember this information when they go to a new employer. In a worst case scenario, they may actively seek it out to take with them. Even if they're not intentionally misusing this information, they may disclose it accidentally when they're attempting to make a sale to a prospective customer or when they encounter a social engineer. You may be wondering what this has to do with computer security, but we want to think of security as protecting the assets that the business cares about. It could be trade secrets, customer list, the business strategy, the payroll data, financial data, the cash accounts, or even their employee list. Salespeople usually travel a great deal, and they need notebook computers so they can give PowerPoint presentations, read the company email, and track their expense reports. So we get a new notebook computer for them, encrypt the drive, and send them on their way. It's common practice in a lot of companies to allow the user to have local administrator rights on the notebook. Why is this done? Well, when they're traveling, a lot of times they'll want to connect to that wireless access point or they'll need to install a printer driver. They need to be able to read and write to the USB key in case someone needs a copy of their presentation. You can try to reduce this access through built-in security groups and file and registry changes, but that's going to be a tough sale. You just cannot let a salesperson fly across the country to meet with someone they've been trying to meet for six months, only to have them get locked out of their computer through security controls. It's common practice also to create a second account with an administrator account whenever they need access to install software or and a user level account for everyday use. The problem with this is they will use the administrator account for the day-to-day -day use and the administrator account and the local user account whenever the IT people are around. When salespeople go on the road, they may want to use the computer to entertain themselves. Now this may be innocent enough, they may be playing solitaire on the computer, they may be listening to their unpatched and unauthorized iTunes and their pirated music, or they may be looking for art photos and foreign films. When they come back into the office, the users will plug their notebook into the network and it's been exposed to who knows what. It's creating a modern day typhoid Mary. So how can you avoid these landmines? Management should compartmentalize the information that salespeople can access. In fact, not just salespeople, but everyone. If the territory is Florida, do they really need sales numbers for Seattle? I realize this can be an uphill battle because good salespeople will look for a sale whenever they can get it. You want to make an extra effort to make sure your mobile devices are patched. When they come back, do you have some type of network access control to monitor the systems? Do you have a policy to regularly review mobile device usage? I've discussed several job roles that can create security issues, but I'd like to discuss one final group. Security people. We certainly mean well. We want to protect businesses, but some of our own actions undermine our own efforts. It's so easy to be focused on the complex that we overlook the simple. We want to think of the firewall as the perimeter of our network 
when it's actually the people. If we put security controls that are in place and they're not transparent, the users will attempt to evade the security controls. If they're not able to evade the security controls, they'll attempt to avoid us. They will try to ignore the security issues and the business considerations. We work very difficult. This is a very difficult field that requires a great deal of expertise. We work so very hard to master our skills that it's only natural to develop a bit of a swagger. Your coworkers may not know what a PEBCAC error is or an ID10T error is, but they can tell from your actions and attitudes if you consider them just clueless. But you know, true heroes do not need to swagger. I knew my uncle had served in World War II, but I knew very little about his experiences. The last time I saw him, he told me about building bridges and clearing mines. He said that in battle, everyone is frightened, but you do the job despite your fears, and you always help your buddies. He didn't say much else about the war. Perhaps he wanted to forget some of the things that he had seen. It was only after he passed away and I read his commendation papers that I realized he was a hero. To be respected in your organization, you need to help the organization fulfill its mission. If you're willing to pitch in when and where you're needed, you'll make a difference. You see, my uncle was repairing roads on December 16, 1944, when the German army started a major counterattack that was later came known as the Battle of the Bulge. The 4th Infantry Division had suffered major casualties in several nearby battles and was in dire need of replacements. Major General Middleton assigned the 159th Engineering Battalion to the 12th Infantry Regiment under Major General Barton as an additional infantry unit. Despite being an engineering unit with little infantry training, the units were giving orders to take and defend Hill 313 in Luxembourg. After an intense firefight, Company B was able to take the hill. They were forced to take shelter in the frozen foxholes and the sub-zero December temperatures. Barrages of heavy artillery killed scores of Company B's men and supported the waves of inf enemy infantry attempting to retake the hill. Outnumbered by a margin of three to one and cut off from all means of resupply, the soldiers fought bravely without food, medical supplies, and limited ammunition. The battery and the radio was dead. They could only hope that they would be rescued before they were overrun. Finally, after seven days, other units of General Patton's 3rd Army were able to rescue the brave young men. In recognition of valor in the face of the enemy, my uncle was awarded the Silver Star. I am honored to have someone so heroic in my family. In memory of Corporal Thomas Hopper, 3rd Army, 8th Corps, 159th Combat Engineering Battalion, Company B. Thank you. I'd also like to announce that there will be a party at 10 o'clock with Rapid 7 sponsoring, and I understand there's going to be free beer and dual car will be performing. Thank you. <laughs>